Here he is on the A number one air hot seat. It's Mike Golick Jr. Thanks for joining us again, sir. Fellas, nice to see you in person, not oh. just on the Zoom call. Hey, Here yes. We go. The beard looks great. even better in person, bro. I've been letting it ride. I, I went for an unexpected and unintentional no shave November. Had to clean up my life a little bit in December there. Had a couple of weddings and events, but now we're back to the animal. All right, we're sort of halfway through the Vegas week. How's the body holding up? Are you staying hydrated, bouncing back properly? So far, so good. I, I've managed to resist the call of the night out here early on in the week. And so I rolled into the day feeling better than anyone should 72 hours into being in Vegas. Yeah, you said you were uh, starting to see some familiar faces. Maybe tonight you won't be able to fight off that. Or who's the one person that might be able to drag you out of the hotel? Man, I, I mean, there's a few in there. Nate Tice over at The Athletics, a good buddy of mine. We're around the same age. We both just... Where he was at Wisconsin when I was at Notre Dame. He ended up hosting one of my best friends on an official. We've always had this connective tissue, and we don't get to see each other that often. Nate's a, lo a Vegas local, okay. so I'm counting on him to show me some of the local fare. But, you know, seeing Dominique Foxworth and Mina Kimes and all those guys roll into town right now, Stu Gotts and the Levitard crew. I mean, if Stu Gotts doesn't make you want to get drunk and make questionable decisions, <laughs> I don't really know if you have a pulse. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no question, dude. He's going to be taking you through the, the dispensaries as well. Oh, Stu Gotts God. will get you on that gummy train i can't believe he hasn't lit a cigarette in radio row that feels like his destiny <laughs> oh that's his move mike goldie jr here with you on the fan okay uh what's your favorite topic you've heard so far on the radio man so far i, I think i've enjoyed well my favorite topic that we've discussed in the last couple weeks, and it carried over to this week because Chip Kelly is getting interviews is that all these college coaches are suddenly leaving to the NFL because they're scared of this NIL boogeyman, and this is the source of all the bad things that are happening. That's been the one that's ticked me off the most. I think this week I've enjoyed kind of what's felt like a refreshing reset on the Brock Purdy conversation. Like everyone all of a sudden stopping to kind of appreciate, like, oh, man, like, we did the Mr. Irrelevant thing. We know that's part of the story, but now he's in the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. and he got injured in the NFC Championship last year and had surgery and came back and had a prolific passing season, led the NFL in a bunch of passer ratings. Maybe we don't have to just sit around and compare him to Mahomes and Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson, and maybe we can just say, dude has grossly outplayed his draft status, and they can win because of this guy now, which is an insane thing to say about a guy that's come through his path. How, how dug in should media members be? When you have that opinion about somebody – uh, should we be able to like say you know what we were wrong about this guy yeah i mean oh, I, that's the, that's the problem i have there's a lot of, I, I see so many in the world now in the media just dug in they're not no matter what i'm not changing my opinion about this guy that's what i thought he was all the time but then all of a sudden the guy has some success but you still stay dug in on so it. i think one of the other problems that gets exposed with brock is we're having a lot of conversations at the same time mm -hmm. we're responding to a lot of different people at the same time because I'm with you. If you're one that said there's no way they can win with Brock Purdy, you're wrong now. Yeah, We've seen it in the last two playoff right. games in glaring moments and the biggest moments of the game. He's made plays, even after playing poorly, which I'm sure he would admit played poorly in the first three quarters of the Green Bay game, the first quarter of the Lions game, but then he's clicked it on and he's made plays there. At the same time, if the conversation is, hey, should he have been the MVP over someone like Lamar Jackson, I'm going to be a firm no. Yeah. And so I think if you're having that conversation, you're saying, well, is he as good as Mahomes or Burrow? No, I don't believe that. Right. But uh, again, those are the spots where if you're someone that just said, yeah, they can't win with this guy, you are flat out wrong and you should be able to admit that. How good is he? I mean, and is, is it possible if you're not the most toolsy guy, you can still uh, execute in this league? Because for me, what I need to see him is in a variety of contexts without the loaded roster for a full evaluation. Yeah, and, and you know what? It's one of those things that like part of that is I understand it, and especially because we just came off a tenure where we saw Jimmy Garoppolo labeled as this winner, and if he's healthy, that he's on the field, they can win with him. And then we saw him go to Las Vegas, and man, it wasn't great even when he was healthy, and you know, health was always kind of a question for him anyway. And so you were kind of having to beat those allegations. Kyle Shanahan's always been a guy that's felt like the quarterback of that team, but I do think he showed in pivotal moments, and statistically you can back it up. He's better than anything that they ever got from Jimmy Garoppolo. He can do things we saw with his legs. He can make the yeah. plays that we ask guys to off script, kind of to that point about, well, can you do it without the roster? Can you do it when the play breaks down? He can do that part. The rest of the stuff with the roster, like, listen, Mahomes, we saw the special. He did have Tyreek Hill and Andy Reid. Joe Burrow, we've seen the special, and I understand he was behind a sieve of an offensive line, but he did have two all-pro wide receivers on the outside. You can go on and on down the list and find help for these guys in certain areas. Brock has certainly been it from a lot of that, but I think 
a lot of times we assume the quarterbacks can always just bootstrap that. Look at Matthew Stafford and what it took for him to win. That guy went to Detroit as a top overall pick. He couldn't lift them out of the obscurity of that franchise. And he had Calvin Johnson and Golden Tate and all these different guys at his disposal there. So it's never quite that easy, even though I fall victim to the same thing time and time again, too. We probably give Mahomes a, just slightly too much credit for this because his roster is really good. Uh, you know what? Mahomes is one of those guys where I still don't know if we ever give him enough credit. <laughs> okay. Like, just because, and to your point here, we're allowed to say quarterbacks need help in order to succeed. We're also allowed to be really impressed that the Chiefs have been able to completely rework the identity of their team around the pivot point that is Patrick Mahomes. Like, you can't let Tyreek Hill walk unless you have Patrick Mahomes. You can't go all in on this style of offense where now it's, hey, we tried the receivers out and only one of them works. And only one of them besides Travis Kelsey works and Rasheed Rice. And so we're going to tighten this thing down. We're going to run more. But then with 219 left in the game on third down, we're going to let Mahomes air it out to a receiver that struggled all year because we still trust that guy in those moments. And so I, I still think he's a guy. He deserves every bit of praise and then some that he gets because they've been able to do this already, make a massive change in their identity because of him. You got Gojo with us here in the G-Bag G Nation. Gavin brought up uh, the headlines. The Mike Vrabel storyline, wow. where he's not hired, and Diana Rossini reporting a GM saying the uh, you know physically imposing and timid. I mean, what? The That's hell? so cool. <laughs> if someone told you you were too physically imposing <laughs> to do the job, you were too terrifying. I would be walking around ten foot tall and bulletproof the next day, kicking doors in left and right. You wouldn't be able to tell me a damn thing. And I, 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 I know Diana well enough, and love Diana enough. And listen, she knows Mike Rabel well enough to know that this is something that it sounds wild when you say it, but really, I think it's more about the implication of, hey, what we talked about with Bill Belichick, why he didn't get hired in this cycle. People are worried, hey, maybe you don't play as well with others. Maybe you want a little bit too much control. Does his style still work in today's NFL? I think with Mike Vrabel, it's some of those same things where, hey, in this world where it's supposed to be all collaborative and everybody's supposed to be arm in arm and moving in the same direction, he's a guy that is a big, gruff guy. And maybe yeah. for some people, they can't handle that kind of presence. To me, that's more of a them problem than it is a Mike Vrabel problem. Mm -hmm. But I... I, I I don't know. It's a funny headline, and I think we should still all run with it because it's objectively hilarious. It he is hilarious. Mark, he intimidated the hell out of Stugatz when we were in Tahoe. My dad and him played in the same tournament group at the uh, American Century Classic in Tahoe, and he's bombing them off the tee. Stugatz is on the bag for my dad. And Stugatz <laughs> is like, he absolutely intimidated me out there. He was incredible. <laughs> Have you figured out which player, which NFL player got bit by the Coyote? You know, the so the so as, as Bobby Boucher once said, the switch continues. Uh, I would kill to find out the answer to that because that also means someone was going out to test one of those coyotes. I know. Because, I mean, they're not around the strip here. I haven't seen a coyote. I don't know if you no. guys have. No, no, no. It's supposedly at the, uh, at the L Las Vegas Lake. Uh, Lake Las Vegas. So if we were to power rank the players most likely to go in search of a fight with a coyote, it's George Kittle and then a massive yeah. gap between everyone else. No right? question about it. In terms of trying I to go toe-to-toe, so. -to -toe, you know, like Broadus was was suggesting maybe, hey, you're out there, you're boozing, you're hanging out, you're taking the outdoor leak, yeah. sure. and then all of a sudden here comes the coyote think, you yeah. stepped into their territory, yeah. you know. But I, I, we were kind of maybe running with Kadarius Tony. You know, I could see him <laughs> slipping into just a, a, a very stupid I'll show thing. you how not injured I am. <laughs> yeah. Check this out. I'm going to tussle with a coyote. I'm waiting for an injury report. I need to see somebody questionable with a coyote bite. But yeah, questionable bite right. marks. Rabies. Is he foaming at the mouth? Rabies. God, he is ready for this game. He is foaming at the mouth. Woo. What are these for? Intimidation. Intimidation. Cowboys searching for a defensive coordinator. Rivera, Zimmer. Uh, where would you be looking to go if you're in charge of hiring a DC right now? So I, I've heard, and, and David Hellman, good friend, obviously someone for Cowboys fans familiar with, covered the team very well for a long time and, and pointed out that a veteran name like that, even if maybe looking for an up-and-comer might be better, is much more in line with what Jerry Jones is used to. The Mike Zimmer one is really interesting to me, and I saw some quotes the other day from Harrison Smith, yeah. former teammate of mine at yeah. Notre Dame, Viking safety who played for Zim for a long time, talking about the way he challenged him and the standard he set in that room. And I think what you saw for young players, especially on that defense, what Micah Parsons has become, he lauded Dan Quinn yeah. for that leadership of the way he challenged him, the way he approached him. And I think for, for Micah, a guy that's obviously going to be the fixture of this defense for a long time that would be an interesting voice. Obviously, Mike had his flaws as a head coach, Mike Zimmer, but as a defensive coordinator, to have a guy who is that standard-oriented, detail-oriented with a group that's got some things they need to clean up in the run game, but a bunch of great weapons would be a pretty enticing combination. Mike Goley Jr., man, whenever we're done with these conversations, you know, we send it to break, and you get off the Zoom call and stuff, and we, we just talk about how 
the words, the takes come so easy to you, you know? And you must, you, do you feel like you have life by the balls right now, working with dad, living in Malibu, <laughs> just, it, man. just freaking dominating? Uh, you know what? I, I am very fortunate. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys gassing me up because when I go back over there and work with dad, he's there to knock me down and beg every chance <laughs> he gets that. because you need that, which I in turn do for him because he did the whole gray hair, beard, zaddy glow up. I got all my friends in sports media <laughs> thirsting after my 61 year old dad. So uh, I'm there to. I've heard it far too often. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm there to cut his knees out from under him every once in a while. But, no, nah, it's been good, man. Being a West Coast guy for a little bit has been a fun change of pace. I did a lot of time in Central Connecticut. I loved ESPN. I love Connecticut. But, man, I love the beach even more. <laughs> I bet. Thank you so much. Enjoy the week. And, uh, and give him hell. We'll be pulling for you. Absolutely. Appreciate it, guys.